So, after AlexNet came a time of many different architecture innovation. So, let's go through a few of them. In 2014, the next outstanding network was VGG. It was developed by the Visual Geometry Group in Oxford. And their problem was uh, beat AlexNet on ImageNet. And um, it uses smaller filters and deeper networks. Let's look a little at the architecture. What we have is instead of having like an immediate uh, immediate layer with uh, with very large filters and big stripe it has small filters here so we go through two layer two two convolution layers here at si at the full image size 224 then comes a max pool layer we go through another two convolution layers another max pool three convolution layers another max pool see how the numbers of parameters goes up as we go through the networks another three layers another max pool another three layer another max pool and then a full three layer fully connected before having the output with the self max okay so in a way it's similar to alexnet but it has smaller filters and it's considerably deeper so why all the uh, fully connected layers well they're an uh, MLP, they're basically able to do interesting nonlinear calculations on that. And um, the architecture, of course, as you saw, it changes. It jumps from the eight layers of AlexNet to like 16 to 19 layers, depending on how you count. Uh, it uh, uses only three by three convolutions uh, with stride one, padding one, and only two by two max pool stride twos. And um, effectively, uh, it therefore has fewer parameters, you know, uh, or like at certain places it has fewer parameters. Now, like instead of going from a large, say, 11 by 11 filter, which takes 121 parameters, it has just 3 by 3, which, uh, which gives us 9 locally. And, uh, that's, uh, and having fewer parameters, in a way, often makes performance better for these. Again, you remember because fewer parameters means better generalization performance. But of course, it's still an incredibly big network with a lot, a lot of parameters. Um, and it achieved 8% top five error, and therefore it was considerably better. And it has certain drawbacks. It was incredibly slow to train. The weights uh, themselves are quite large in terms of disk and bandwidth, and the size of a VGG is over 530 megabytes, uh, which makes deploying it kind of uh, tiresome suddenly at that time. So next came GoogleNet. So GoogleNet uses the so-called inception modules. And um, it basically replaced individual layers where we say, okay, we do a three by three convolution with a two by two max pool with these little so-called inception modules. And here, here the architecture is we have uh, the inception modules, a grid size uh, reduction with some tricks, another set of inception modules, another grid size uh, reduction, and another set of inception modules, and then finally, again, a big readout. So, um, uh, in the first version of inception, you can say kernel size tuning is hard. Now, like, should we use a 5x5 five five kernel, or should we use a 3x3 three three kernel, or should we use no kernels at all? Um, it's hard to know it. And also, if you're Google, then why decide if you can have all of them? So that's what they did. So they first have a one by one layer here. Now that just allows you to make more feature dimensions, if you want, followed by a five by five. And then they also have a one by one followed by a three by three. And then they have a pooling layer followed by a one by one. And they have a direct one by one. And then they all, they concatenate all of these together that produces an inception module. So the idea is that therefore, instead of having to choose one, you can have all of them at the same time. And uh, like often in machine learning, when we build ensemble methods, we get better in this case, by giving these different possibilities, the system will be doing somewhat better. And, um, now there's uh, there's of course certain representational bottlenecks. Um, 
uh, you can have, uh, it's often the case that you have worse learning properties when the dimensions of the uh, data are drastically changed all at once, which uh, happened in the original version. And so uh, they then uh, replaced it with this slide version, where you see the 5x5 five five has been replaced by, three, uh, by two subsequent 3x3 three three layers. Okay, but it's still the general idea. We basically want these different, want to not choose one of these architectures, but have all of them, concatenate them, and then basically allow the gradient descent to choose how important each of these channels should be. So what were the results? They get to 6.7% top five error rate. Now, that wasn't quite as good as humans because Carpathy tried it and uh, was able to do 5.1%, which is actually quite interesting. It requires considerable training of humans to get good at ImageNet. So you need to train humans on ImageNet so that they're good at ImageNet, which is quite interesting. So there's a problem if you want to really go deep. And, um, uh, and that's the following. If you, if you say take a data set like CIFA 10 that we have here and you plot error as a function of the iteration, what we can see no, and like you always have these jumps, which is places where the uh, where the uh, where the speed of SGD uh, is 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 made slower. Now, like you get better performance, but but slower when you do that. And so, what what uh, what can be seen here is that if you make the networks uh, very deep, then they don't converge to good values anymore. Now, so twenty layers is actually better than thirty layers, which is better than forty which is better than 50. So um, the idea that going deeper helps doesn't seem to be right, at least when we have a fixed period of training. And um, so, so it doesn't seem that simply adding more and more layers is actually the solution to the problem that we're looking for after all. So now here comes uh, here comes the idea of ResNets. Now like, look at here wh what we have on the left-hand side. We have VGG. It starts with convolution, max pulse, convolution, max pulse, convolutions, max pulse, and so forth. Um, you can have a 34 layer plane network that basically goes through this, just like VGG just makes it really deep, where each, uh, uh, where each, uh, where you have lots of layers in each of them. But here comes the cool idea of ResNets. What you do is you model basically the differences. So what you do is you take the output here, and you add that, keep in mind that in this whole stack, we always have the same dimension. So you add what goes in here to this one, and you add it to this one, and you add it to this one. And by having these, these, these connections that go through it, these effective skip connections, what it allows the network is to model basically changes through that, through what we'd have if we had the identity transformation from here to here. And this is actually quite interesting because, because now there's a shortest path. You know, like we can go from here through these skips to here, to, to here, through these skips to here, through these skips to here and so forth. So the network is at the same time a relatively shallow network and a very, very deep network. And you can immediately see why this seems like a good idea. So how does the res, uh, ResNet work? We have uh, an input, we have a weight layer with a reload, another weight layer, but now here we take the output of this and we add the input of everything X to it, and then we apply the reload to it. So thereby, there is this shortcut path. Whereas what these do is they basically model how we should change the input X so that this is as good as possible. And uh, so H, what we have here is the desired mapping. And we hope that we can fit this with a small local network. And, um, uh, and uh, if the optimal mapping is closer to the identity, it's easier to find those relevant small fluctuations. Now, if you have a very deep network, you can say each layer doesn't need to do all that much to its input. It might be sufficient to do relatively small changes. And therefore, it's intuitively desirable to use something like ResNets. And indeed, if they use ResNets, the performance looks very, very different they find that basically ResNet 20 does a good job, but 
if we go you go from 20 to 30 you're doing better and the deeper you go the better it gets and so uh, same thing on ImageNet now, like you they really get mileage by going from 18 layers to 34 layers here why do you find in neural network papers that there's so much on these small data sets like CIFAR 10 well you can run this very very quickly whereas ImageNet as you may remember is a very large uh, uh, data set and that just means that it costs you a lot of compute to calculate anything with it. So why do they work? Uh, if we look at the paths if we remove a layer, let's say we remove layer uh, F1, there's still two paths how we can get from the output to the input. Now like imagine this layer for some reason totally cuts out, no? like no gradients, no forward calcul uh, no forward. Uh, propagation but we can still get gradients to this path and this path and therefore we will have much less worry about vanishing gradients and in fact you can model the the uh, the last landscape we will at some point of time talk about how we make these uh, without skip connections the uh, the last landscape looks really bizarre whereas with the skip connections it has a much smoother much more meaningful uh, landscape where we can hope that optimization will work much better now, a next innovation here is ResNext, where you could take that same basic idea and uh, that we have in um, in uh, in ResNet, and we can basically have multiple channels in parallel that have uniform multi-branch structure, and in some cases it really helps. And um, now let's briefly ask ourselves. How does the ResNet implement the identity function? No. What if we want, if we needed that through a bunch of layers, it's the same at the output as it's in the input? Well, that's actually very simple. Uh, we set all weights to zero. Now, like if if it does nothing in the network, it will stay an identity function. Now, here's another network that came a little later, DenseNet. In the case of DenseNet, uh, what we do is we take every layer and take the output and not only give it to the next layer, but allow it to skip the next layer and skip the next layer and skip the next layer. And thereby, of course, it gets to be longer and longer because it's all concatenated with one another. But it shares a lot of the desirable properties of the ResNet, namely that, you can, that there are short paths that connect the transition layer where the max pool happens to to all to the previous layers and basically they exist in a way the network is at the same time a shallow network and a deep network and that of course helps massively to deal with vanishing gradient problems strengthens feature propagation encourages feature reuse now if there's something useful in these features that can be used by many of these future layers it will reuse it and it also can substantially reduce the number of parameters relative to the resonance now, let's think a little bit about the usefulness of skip uh, connections. Take ResNet, update it, and understand the role of skip connections in this context. 